Hello, this is Samay Jain from the University of Toledo. I'm a urologist and I'm here to present SLS highlights from day two. Starting with our first session, which was the best of updates. Dr. Maurice Chung gave a very nice presentation about the approach to pudendal neuralgia. He reviewed the Nantes criteria which helps in guiding clinicians and diagnosing this challenging problem. He also discussed some therapeutic options with respect to pudendal nerve blocks and the success rates associated with, with those treatments. Dr. Stringle reviewed simulation and training and made it a point to sit, say that one size does not fit all in terms of how we educate learners and that we need to tailor surgical education based on the skill level of the learner as well. And he really demanded that we look for a paradigm shift on how we educate our learners to make it more impactful. We reviewed computer-assisted surgery. Dr. Redan, in his introduction, reviewed what he believes will be an important and key part in integrating robotic surgery into hospitals and say that the entire surgical team will require education to ensure the safety of our patients. We were fortunate to have a representative of the FDA, Dr. Benita Shar, who reviewed the vision for the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health, division of the FDA, and the vision really states that the United States should still remain the world leader in medical device innovation. She also made it very clear that the FDA regulates medical devices and that it does not regulate the practice of medicine, and urged the practitioners and hospital administrators to determine how best to regulate the practice of medicine. Dr. Steven Schweitzberg reviewed the information that's being collected on physicians and providers. And while it seemed we were part of the galactic empire, this is something that's actually being put upon us by the government. Um, I thought part of what he said, which made a lot of sense, and I think is very important for practitioners to take forward, is that we need to control the data being used to assess us. And either we'll be at the table or we'll be on the menu. And so the era of big data collection is not going to go away. And it's the practitioners, we need to really control how we're being assessed. Dr. Satava reviewed training and credentialing through FRS and CSATs. And some quotes from his presentation that I thought were particularly impactful was that practice is what you do on your own time and training is what you do with the third party observer. He stated that training and assessment are two sides of the same coin and that if we're really going to practice evidence-based medicine, we need to practice evidence-based education, which I thought was very important. Dr. Wetter reviewed the OR Ready project, which SLS is helping to pioneer, basically stating that we are taking a very serious approach to OR safety and that there are uh, quantifiable steps that we can do to help make sure the OR is safe. The next session was our favorite surgical energies and why we use them. Dr. Morrison gave a very intriguing conversation uh, and presentation on monopolar energy, which is the most commonly used surgical energy source. He uh, had a few slides I thought were really good to share, which is the collateral thermal damage seen from monopolar energy, and this is per time used. So for every second, you see thermal spread of that magnitude, and as surgeons, we should be very careful on how we use monopolar energy. He also had a nice summary slide discussing how the visible effect relates to the actual delayed effect on the tissue, and that if you're seeing blanching or shrinkage, sloughing is going to occur, and you need to assess that. My conversation was about high-intensity focused ultrasound, which is a good in-between option for patients who are not candidates for surveillance for prostate cancer, and that with improved imaging, HIFU could be used for focal therapy for prostate cancer and help mitigate morbidity. Dr. Brill reviewed the bipolar electrical surgical devices, and a few take-home points are that the bipolar circuit is created with the instrument, whereas with the monopolar, it's created through the patient and that original devices required monitoring for signs for desiccation, whereas more advanced modern bipolar devices do that for you. Just be aware that steam that's created by the bipolar can damage tissue around your area of interest, and that can result in uh, collateral damage. The next session was on surgeon's health, which I thought was a particularly important and impactful uh, presentation. Dr. Shattuck, in his introduction, mentioned how big of a problem this actually is, and that 59% of 
physicians would not recommend a career in medicine to their children, which shows that this is a topic that really needs to be discussed in detail. Dr. Rawlings discussed mental and emotional health and avoiding burnout, and he said there are basically three themes to burnout across any industry. As you can see here, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and a sense of reduced personal accomplishment. The ACS performed a very large survey, and in it they found that a very significant proportion of surgeons had experienced burnout, and probably most alarmingly, 6% had suicide ideation during the previous year. So something that, again, is a, is a pervasive problem among surgeons and needs to be addressed. Um, in terms of how can we make it better, well, we have to find meaning in work, focus on what is important maintaining a positive outlook and attitude and work-life balance. I think many hospitals and medical schools are going to start incorporating this into their curriculum. Dr. Berger discussed ergonomics and how this can impact patient, excuse me, uh, surgeon satisfaction. Um, laparoscopic instruments are not the most ergonomic, and he gave us tips on how to make the surgeries more ergonomic by lowering the OR table and working at the elbow level and also doing robotics where possible. Dr. Gary Cummings, uh, the chancellor, um, of North Carolina at Pembroke, gave a conversation about transitioning from surgery, a very personal vignette that was uh, very impactful. And I think the most important slide that he gave us was that it was a quote by Mark Twain, which is the two most important days in your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. And really understanding at each stages of our lives, what are we trying to accomplish and, and who do we want to be? In the spotlight presentations, Dr. James Rosser gave an update on GERD and explained that GERD is a very common problem that accounts for 22% of all PCP visits, and he recommended a stepwise approach to diagnosis and treatment using objective assessment of symptoms, selection of diagnostic tests, and evidence-based medicine treatment plan. Dr. Braithwaite reviewed bariatric surgery and the current procedures and best practice. He stated that gastric bypass is still the gold standard and has low leak rates. The adjustable gastric band is an option, but it has fallen out of favor because of high complication rates. Sleeve gastrectomy is a great option, except for patients with Barrett's esophagus, but it may work via both mechanical and hormonal mechanisms. And the biliopancreatic diversion with duodenal switch procedure is still in its infancy because of a steep learning curve and has not been well adopted in the U.S. Dr. Conforto reviewed the algorithms in evaluating and treating pelvic pain. And on this slide, you can see that there are multiple etiologies for pelvic pain. And Dr. Levy followed up with an adjunctive talk discussing the practice paradigm and made a point that monotherapy really doesn't work for pelvic pain and we should discuss uh, multimodal therapy options for treating the pain and that understanding neuroplasticity will help us cure the disease. Dr. Ross discussed the applications of robotic surgery and focused on when to implement integration of the robot. Adoption of the robot can allow for more patients to have minimally invasive surgery with more traditionally trained surgeons, so it's really allowed for dispersion of the technology to other areas and allowing patients to have minimally invasive surgery. Dr. Sobolowski reviewed the dilemma with tissue extraction and journey of discovery, and in his talk he gave a very personal account of what's happened with uh, tissue extraction because of uh, previous cases that have resulted in patient harm. He said that the incidence of Lyme sarcoma of the uterus is about 1 in 2,500, that the paradigm of extracting benign fibroids is shifting, but without great evidence to support a new gold standard and will be a topic of conversation going forward. That wraps up the uh, main session from SLS Day 2. Thank you.